Hey, it's Nicole. Welcome back to the show. I'm so excited to introduce you to Jermaine Cheatham. He, man, comes with a really impressive bio. I can't wait for you to learn more about him and his business, one of his businesses, Creators Learn. Jermaine has a pretty impressive background, folks. An entrepreneur with 50 plus million in sales. Yeah, there's even a plus sign there. He's a professional mentor and top speaker on all the things that Matt and I love to chat about just on our regular off day. Money, sales, marketing, entrepreneurship, and personal growth too. Hey, if you're an entrepreneur who usually fast forwards intros just like this one, this is the podcast for you. Hey, just a reminder, our show is brought to you by Smart Cookie Media, where we believe data tells a story, and not just any story, your business story. As a subscriber to the show or as a client, you'll get insights on profitable data-driven marketing strategies that work for you and your business, your industry, not some cookie cutter trends, no, ideas that are led by your customer data so you know they'll work for you. Connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram to learn more. Everything's in the show notes. Now, let's get back to the show. Jermaine, welcome to the show. So glad to have you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here with you guys. Welcome, Jermaine. I'd love to start off the way we do with every single guest. How would you finish this sentence? You know you're an entrepreneur when? I believe you know you're an entrepreneur when you're walking metaphorically in the dark and you don't know where you're going. You don't know what is in front of you. You can't see anything. But you just keep walking because you believe in where you're going, even though there's no evidence that you're going in the right direction. Being an entrepreneur is understanding the hardest part is the darkness right before the dawn. Oh my gosh, All right. so true. That, that was some deep philosophical compared to some of the other responses we've had in the past. So I have to ask you this, Jermaine, are you truly going in the right direction if you've never really experienced the pain or the darkness? Like if you've never had that failure, like if everything you've ever had has been lined up perfect for you, or it seems like, you know, home run after home run after home run, it's always been a question. Do you really need to have the failure, that pain to drive you through that darkness, as you call it? You have to. It's a prerequisite. If you don't have it, then you're not challenging yourself to something difficult enough that actually forces you into that dark cave. It's like Carl Jung always says, that dark cave you don't want to go down is the dark cave you have to go down. That's just part of the hero's journey. And in order to really grow as a person, as a business, as an entrepreneur, you have to push yourself to a point where you feel like you are completely lost. There's no hope and you may end up broke, bankrupt in the streets. But from that place of that desperation, you start to get creative. You start to get hungry. You start to do whatever it takes by any means necessary to find your way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I view it as being really scrappy. You know, Matt, I didn't think it, the darkness as much of failure, although there is that, that's for sure. Right. As much of it as finding your way through ambiguity, right? Well, you don't know. I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to die trying. But I think Jermaine's hitting something like the nail on the head here. If there's a word I could plot, growth. If you're not persistently seeking out that growth, it almost seems like you're not pushing yourself. You do it naturally, or like you do it naturally in your business. But I think that there was a time, even in my life as an entrepreneur, where I kept saying, well, I'm an entrepreneur, but everything I've ever done has just kind of been lined up for me. I'm a lawyer, I'm at the law school, I did this, I did this. And so it was only until I started to take some more, I'll say, risk that pushed my growth. I started really seeing myself like, oh, wow, this is where I'm starting to walk with faith, so to speak, into the darkness. Yeah, for sure. Because if you watch anything in the natural world, it's a struggle to grow. Think about a flower coming up through the ground. It's a struggle against the elements to grow and become something that you were not before. I like the way you guys are reframing it because, you know, sure, it's a struggle, but a struggle doesn't have to be a bad thing. Struggle can be an adventure. And yes. if you reframe things as adventures and it becomes fun, you can gamify it because we don't know the results. Like we can control the process, but we cannot control the results. We never have and never will. But if you can control the process and make the process fun and gamify it and make it into an adventure, well, then all of a sudden, all these things and people come to you that would normally not come to you because you're exuding this type of energy that is confident, that is fun, that is curious, that is enjoying the process. And people like people that are enjoying themselves. So I always try to embrace that mindset of like, this isn't a struggle. Yeah, it's hard, but this is part of the process. It's like, that Macklemore song, he's always talking about these were the good old days. Like the good old days aren't at the top of the mountain. The good old days are in the darkness. 
Because yeah. once you achieve something and you get all the money or all the freedom and all the stuff, it's like, well, now I got to find a new mountain because now I'm bored. Like the really fun part is being in that dark cave, knowing at some point you're going to figure this thing out. Oh, I feel seen, attacked a little bit in the best way. I do. <laughs> Be patient, Nicole. Keep going. It's fine. Yeah. And gamifying. It's so funny. I wish my husband felt the exact same way about some of my business adventures, but that's what it is. And the opposite for me would be harder. Sit in corporate life. That would be harder. It was. I've tried it. That was. The <laughs> I was like, I was like, well, they lost. You didn't lose that. Game. They lost, they, right? Because they yeah, lost. Yeah, they lost by firing me a couple times. Yeah, but exactly. They exactly. <laughs> I won that game for sure. Oh my gosh, the best little runway severance check ever. Shout out to them. They probably think it's negative when I say it, but yeah. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay, what businesses do you own? What do you do? So I've really, you know, been focused on mastering one thing. And so I've only been involved in one business, commercial lending. And within commercial lending, it's a really specific niche where we help businesses get funding to buy essential equipment to operate. So just think of a, a doctor that needs to buy a new ultrasound machine. I would give them the loan for that. And most people think, hey, don't doctors just go to the bank? But no, really, they work with people like myself that partner with the equipment sellers. So I don't chase the doctors. I don't chase the people that need the financing. I just partner with the equipment sellers and they do all the work for me. They do all the selling for me. So literally it's an extremely streamlined leverage business model. That is my first business that I've been doing since 2015. And I realized when I was traveling in Europe with my mom for her 60th birthday, I was like, I got to figure out how to streamline this because I want to enjoy Europe. I don't want to be working. So we really figured out how to button up the business model where it operates almost seamlessly while I sleep. So I can figure out how to get my location freedom and my time freedom back. And after we took that three, four week trip, we realized there's nothing special about me. I have no special skill set. Anyone can do this to really free themselves. So we put together this training program where it helps other entrepreneurs, other salespeople learn exactly how to do this commercial lending in this equipment financing space so they can create this autonomy of their day, of their money, and create really the business and lifestyle that they dream of. So that is what Creators Learn is about. I'm not only a teacher and a mentor, but I'm a practitioner. I've been doing this thing since 2003 as an employee and then also as an entrepreneur. So I have this expertise in understanding leverage, systems, simplicity. Just nobody knows about it because most people think people go to the bank to get funding and get loans. But you have tapped into, you know, some diversification because of your expertise, right? Once you've mastered that craft, you talked about being able to teach this model to other people. I'm sure there's other ancillary ways you've learned how to leverage as well based upon the model of commercial financing. It seems like there's other revenue streams or other potential revenue streams there that are affiliated through this model. Am I correct? Oh, without question. Because first of all, you get paid obviously on commissions as far as how you want to structure the deal, but then you can also include insurance. So you can have an equipment insurance on every deal. So then you get more residual income. And then from there, I'm obviously teaching other entrepreneurs how to do this. So that's another stream of income. And then we help them get their deals done. That's another stream of income. But it all starts with that first lead domino. And most entrepreneurs, especially in this current day and age, they're trying to push over 50 different dominoes at the same time, instead of focusing on that one lead domino that pushes over all the other ones. I just love to stress that concept of Find your lead domino and don't think about any of the other ones until that one is knocked over. It's hard for me because obviously you're on the Serial Entrepreneur Show, Jermaine. So we definitely talk to people who have multiple businesses, multiple revenue streams. But even myself, like I can tell you how the last year or so, because of my background in real estate, because of my affiliations with real estate companies, title, insurance, things like that, how they're all vertically integrated, but connected because like you said, one leads to the other, and leads to the other. But Sometimes it's taken some of us as entrepreneurs a little bit of time to realize what that lead domino might be because we're trying out two or three different things. You know, I'm not saying you got lucky, but it seems like once you found that in 2015, that has now led to multiple other things. I think some of us other entrepreneurs out there might have had to try a couple different things. Let me ask you this, Jermaine, what's your story? Like what's your background? What led you to that? Because that's probably might help us understand what got you to that point where you found commercial finance really luck and trusting myself. So, you know, when I was younger, I always felt like I was a misfit. I was an outcast. I never felt like I really belonged anywhere. And so with that negative framing of my life and how the outside world perceived me, how do I know if they're true unless I challenge it? 
So I went into sales and I realized, oh, I'm good at communication. People like me. And that was all a lie. It's like Einstein's unbelievable question he poses. He says, the most important first question you'll ever answer for yourself is, is the world hostile or is the world friendly? And growing up, I thought the world was hostile until I challenged that narrative when I got my first job out of school. It was with Wells Fargo. And the day before I was going to start, I called my boss and I said, hey, I think I'm worth more. I need a higher starting salary. It didn't go well. <laughs> he told me to kick rocks, rescinded the whole offer. So now like I'm supposed to start tomorrow. Now I have no job. I actually attribute that moment to me choosing myself. I'm worth it. I believe I'm worth more money. And I trusted my true nature to even pick up the phone and tell him that. And that tells me that I am a person that is not someone that's going to work at Wells Fargo as a branch manager. I'm in sales. I'm a go-getter. I decided from that moment, okay, who else is hiring? Only people that were hiring was a sales job where I'm making 300 calls a day to see if these businesses need financing to buy equipment. That's how I fell into it, really by accident, by me just being myself. So tell me, was there some other moment, even when you were younger? Because you started saying when you were younger, and I really wanted to hear where this confidence came from. You viewed the world as hostile. So there's a story there, I know for sure. But something gave you the confidence to even call that guy, whether it was someone daring you, a buddy or something. But somewhere, there's some confidence instilled in you. Yeah, so growing up, I was abandoned by my biological father at like two years old. And then again, by my adopted father at seven, I really started to lean heavily on myself. And I really got focused on developing this mindset of no one can control me. No one can hurt me. Nothing will ever phase me because I'm the captain of the ship. And it really started in sports because sports allowed me to have this confidence started to build as I saw the results of me getting better, getting stronger, getting faster, becoming, you know, the captain of the football team, the point guard of the basketball team, all these things started to compound. I started realizing, hey, I am in control. I have these skills. And I was just talking to a group of our students. I was explaining them this idea of the cookie jar, what David Goggins talks about in his book, They Can't Hurt Me. The idea is anytime you're struggling with something, reach back into something you've done in the past because you've been good at something, no matter how small it was. And remember, when you first started, you sucked at that thing, but you figured it out. So this thing you're struggling with right now, you can figure it out because remember the cookie jar. You've been here. You've done that. And so when I first got into sales, I'm like, let me go to my cookie jar because I've competed in sports. If I can compete in sales, it's the same thing. This isn't rocket science. And same thing with entrepreneurship. When I first started being an entrepreneur, I was like, well, I don't know anything about entrepreneurship, but I competed in sales and I competed in sports. Always kind of remembering if I've done it before, I can do it again in a different genre. Plus, I have a belief that if I see somebody else doing it, then I can do it too. Because we're not that different. Everyone's exactly the same. This looks a little different. So if they figured it out, I can figure it out. So the confidence came from just taking action, believing in yourself, because no one's coming to save you. I love that. So I have a question. I know Nicole and I love digging deeper into the whole like next generation of entrepreneurship and that concept of kids. What do you always say, Nicole? Kids? Kids they can, can see what? it. They can be it. And so the concept of digging back into the cookie jar and being able to remember your sports, remember how it built you up, remember how it gave you that confidence. Do you think there's an impact on individualized sports versus team sports and then how successful people are as entrepreneurs from that? I know this is a kind of a deeper philosophical question, but like you just talked for quite some time about how no one's coming to save you. I think that mindset sometimes really carries in in sports like golf. Like I have a friend of mine whose kid was not excelling in some team sports and they've been doing a lot of running and track recently. And the kid's doing great with cross country, very individualized. It's only you, you in the road. And it's getting into that zone where it's you versus everybody. I think they captains. both work. Yeah. yeah. See, that, helped a little, that helped a little bit. So like, <laughs> I, but, see, I think they both work because if you think about like football, for example, I put myself in positions to be in control. I was the quarterback. So I always had the ball in my hand. In basketball, I was the point guard. I always had the ball in my hand. I love golf too, because golf is a solo sport. It's all you versus you. And I really believe that even with team sports, if you're the type of person that expects excellence from yourself and the others, then you really don't have to say a word because they're going to see it. They're going to see how you conduct yourself in practice. They're going to see how you conduct yourself during the game. They're going to see your intensity about winning. Even if you have to call somebody out, it's like the way Michael Jordan used to treat his teammates. I personally loved it. 
because he's like, we're here to win. We're not here to mess around. I'm dead serious about this. And that's how he felt about it. Even in the team environment, you can become the Michael Jordan. You can become the Colby Bryant. You can become the Wayne Gretzky. Even though it is a team sport, I don't think it matters. I think what matters is you got good at something you were not good at before. And mm -hmm. everyone starts at zero. Everyone starts at shooting air balls. Everyone starts with zero followers. Everyone starts with zero sales. Everybody. Steve Jobs had zero sales for his first device. But look what he built. Nicole, any input on the, I know we always talk about kids in the show and everything. What are you thinking on? You got little ones. What are you thinking on? Yeah, no, I view even team sports the exact same way. Mm -hmm. You can control your space on that court at all times. You win with the team, you fail the team. I feel like there's even more pressure on team sports. So I think that's great. I golf for comedic relief of others around me. So I can't quite talk well, to you about golfing. <laughs> I need to give them lessons for sure. But I do enjoy making people laugh. So maybe I can like be like, hooray, I made someone laugh today. But you can turn golf into a team sport, you're telling me, because you are accepting the role yes. on the golf course. Yes, of, yeah, there you of go. jester. <laughs> and yeah, of jester. <laughs> I, yeah. But I still think, you know, what you have to put in off the court, right? So I played sure. basketball in school. Like, so what you did off the court really, really mattered. And there can only be one Michael. But he oh. knew that he needed his Scotty and he knew he needed Dennis. So he held them accountable. And I think that if you are a person, like Jermaine said, I, I mean, I identify with it, totally different reasons that I don't really fit in here. But I think when that's the case, you just walk through the world a little bit different. And I think what's important to me when I see kids experiencing either entrepreneurship in their home, being flat broke in the 80s, 90s, whether they see some type of results from it or whether they're constantly told, like, go to school and get an office and go work for someone else, you know, take it a little easier than we did. I think all those messages is what jermaine has been talking about, right? They're lies that we believe until we start to realize, wait, that's just a lie I told myself. I think that's really powerful. And the sooner we can help kiddos figure that out, the better for all of us, our communities, our families and our businesses. That's for sure. So tell me about that. So you support entrepreneurs through your work as well. Not only, I mean, doctors, you know, don't exactly identify themselves as entrepreneurs, some of them, but even down to that financing and then in Creators Learn, do you have an example of some successes you're seeing or things that people trip up on all the time? The thing I noticed the most about entrepreneurs that they struggle with is shiny object syndrome. And they go through this cycle that I noticed. It starts with the new idea, right? The new thing. And they get excited about the new thing, but they don't realize in order to actually break through the new thing, they're going to have to go through that midnight darkness we talked about earlier. And most give up and look for a new shiny thing once they're in that midnight darkness. And I tell them over and over again, you're on the right path. You're in the darkness. This is what it's supposed to look like. It always looks like this. You have to just keep going forward. And this is why many entrepreneurs always switch their path because they kind of or salespeople too, they get frustrated, they can't push through and they keep switching and switching. One of our members, he was doing the same thing. He was working part-time as a hospital administrator. He just wanted to make, you know, $20,000, $30,000 extra a month so he could get rid of his nine to five and do his own thing. He wanted to be his own solopreneur in the finance space, but he kept buttoning up against this roadblock of, you know, moving forward in the darkness and understanding we got to give ourselves ample time to find success and have enough at bats and enough reps. It's like if you go to the gym one day a week for six weeks, you say, well, I haven't, I'm not ripped. Well, yeah, call me in six years. Like literally, this is a volume game, sales, business, whatever. And you have to give yourself enough runway, at least say, I'm going to bust my ass for 12 months and then I'll look up and reassess. But don't say I'm going to do it for 12 weeks. And with him, I kept telling him about this, like you're in the darkness. It's okay, keep moving forward. And he saw his way through after a few months. And now he, he makes consistently thirty, forty thousand dollars a month. He's going to leave his hospital job, and he only does this part time. He does this four hours a day. So I think one of the interesting things that I've noticed with entrepreneurs is they don't give themselves enough space and runway and reps to really make an educated decision on is this working or is it not. What was that time period between when he started working with you guys versus when he started getting a little ANC? It sounded like he needs coaching to stay the Good course question. to where. Now he's consistently 30, 40 Gs a month, four hours a day. Yeah. So when he first started, the problem was, this is another big problem for entrepreneurs. They want to be experts without the need to be an expert. What I mean by that is he wanted to be perfect. He wanted to know all the ins and outs. He needed to have all the answers. And in, unfortunately, in business and sales, we're not going to have all the answers. And so for those first three to four months, he did nothing except read and try to learn but took no action. 
he pushed out his first successor for about five months. And then after probably month six, seven, he started having consistent $10,000, $20,000 a month. I have this thing called win before noon. If you put in four hours before noon of dedicated, consistent effort to your one avatar with your one product in your one vertical, you're going to win. And then the whole afternoon is free for you to consume ideas, to refine, to sharpen your sword, to get better, to exercise, whatever the hell you want to do after that, you're done. Really, what you're reminding us all about is that we are problem solvers. See a problem, you want to take action. Now we see another problem, we're, we're trying to figure it out. The problem is, is we're so easy to find a problem, see a problem, find a way to do something better, that that's where that shiny object thing, we start to battle it. I will say that there have been people on this show that have proven to me that sometimes our best ideas come from a whim. You know, you said that you were headed to Wells Fargo, right? And you made this call. And this guy, this branch manager, this district manager, this who's who was like, no, dude, nice try, but you're out. He really should have hired you. Talk about someone who missed out. But I think it is sometimes those ideas that it dawns on us that sometimes our best things can come from this whim because that's what then you built from. You built from you trying something and you're like, you know what, I'm going to try this 300 call a day thing. And then it's stuck and you fell in love with it. But sometimes it's because of our nature to problem solve. We just have to figure out a way to focus it. So you talked earlier about focus. So what are some tips, tricks? What do you do to help focus? I know you just shared with your four hours, win before noon. Is there anything else that's something we'd want to hear on the show for people that have a lot of verticals? How can you help them manage it? Yeah, I think to your point, Nicole, is getting better at the thing you're already doing. So for example, when I was doing the 300 cold calls, it wasn't working out. That was not an efficient way to go about business. And so I had to think, how can I make this better? How can I make this easier? And it came on a whim where I was talking to a guy. He's like, yeah, I have some more deals for you. And I was like, yeah, I have more deals for me. And I realized, why am I calling the people that need the money? I just need to partner with the people that sell the equipment. So instead of me doing 300 cold calls, I'm doing, I don't know, 30 calls a day, very targeted to people that can bring me multiple deals per week, per month. And now it's leveraged. And so the focus, it's not what, it's who. Always thinking about who can get me to where I want to go. And how can I talk to them and convey the message in a way that they understand that I'm here for their best interest. At the same time, I am also here for my best interest. That's not a sugarcoat it. So if you can do that, your focus really becomes focusing on people. Did you understand this concept of focusing on people and leveraging people did you understand it coming out of school? I did not realize it at all until that gentleman I was working with, he says, I'll have some more deals for you. The light bulb went off and said, I'm not leveraging this the right way. I'm chasing instead of just creating relationships with people. See, and I think as an entrepreneur, I've learned that more in the finance space in insurance and other types of financial services. It seems like it naturally clicks a little bit easier there than selling through a traditional business path, trying to sell pens or I don't know, whatever it is. In the finance space, eventually you start seeing it kind of all happen in front of you. You're leveraging money and you're leveraging other people's money and then you're leveraging time. And now you're leveraging networks of people. Yeah. Finance folks, and that was a big part of my background, we don't view the word leverage as bad. We look at it as like, right. that's the only way a teeter-totter works. <laughs> like, that's the way you can cantilever something beautiful off of a deck. It takes leverage. And so you might be absolutely right that other business owners, like let's talk about like a salon business owner that I know, for example. She may not be viewing how she can leverage her clients inside the building. She might ask for a referral or, or hope that they refer. But you're right. Those of us that have had finance experiences are like, okay, I do mortgages. I need to find some referral sources. And they're called realtors. Despite the fact that they sometimes are a little difficult to work for, I bet you I can find a few great ones and make their life easier. Mike McCallowitz, one of my favorite authors, he wrote The Pumpkin Plan, which has a terrible, terrible cover. Mike, I'm not a designer, but I'd love to redesign it for you. And I went to his mastermind and I've listened to this book like, I don't know, three times on Audible. And in the pumpkin plan, he really just talks about how we all should be going to the vendors of our best clients. So some of my best clients are portrait photographers all across the country in Canada. And like, it's best for me to make sure I understand their makeup artists, how they make their lives easier. Well, guess what's going to happen if I go talk to every makeup artist? They're going to refer me to all of their other portrait photographer buddies. And so like, that's a way to leverage. And so if I make content with technology, thinking about the makeup artist, the portrait photographer, and then maybe any other vendor I can think of, maybe it's pro photo. Actually, yeah, pro photo one time actually to come speak at something. So if I can think through that, now all of a sudden I'm leveraging all these little pieces. And you're right. I don't think the salon owners or the local business owners, maybe they're thinking how to leverage their community square, you know, have an art walk or something. But you're right. I think maybe it comes a little bit more basic. 
to those of us that had these finance experiences. So we don't always go on a tangent like that. That was really, really yeah. great, though, because was- I also love that it came from one sentence from this guy. I'll have more deals yeah. for you tomorrow. Yep. Yes. Cha-ching. Just that simple. The friendship begins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Finance is interesting because you're right. There's no product. There's nothing tangible to really hold. And so it's a whole different model because like if you're a salon owner, I would never get in that business because there's no leverage for me personally. Like it's too hands-on, not enough margins, all that stuff. So you have to realize, is that what you really want to do? Is that going to meet your goals? You know, if your goal is to have great relationships with everyone that comes to your salon, then you're having a great life. I love it. But if your goal is to make as much money as quickly as possible, I wouldn't suggest that as the business model. But I think the key thing to hone in on there, though, is identifying what it is that drives you, makes you happy, though, because I think, at least from my perspective today, no matter who the listener is, no matter what industry you're in, if you are happy and you are content doing what you're doing, there probably is a way to get you to that goal of whatever it is in your field or in your business that you've already created. And it's just trying to determine what you can leverage, what you can grow. Like salon would not be it for you, but if I love owning a salon, if I love making people feel beautiful, if it completes me or something. But if someone said to me, hey, you could take your knowledge base and train thousands of salon owners, you could take your knowledge base and franchise your model out. You're still in the salon space. What you've done now, products, like whatever. Paul, Paul Mitchell what you, figured it out. But exactly. Exactly. Regardless of the space I think you're in, there's a way to figure out how to leverage people, their networks, time, and get where you want to go. I just don't think sometimes people sit down and really put the time in to figure out what it is. They're too busy and busy, Bill. They're too busy cutting that hair, right? Hey there, busy movers and shakers. I get it. You're out there conquering the business world, hustling day in, day out. Well, guess what? We've got something to amplify your efforts, something that's about to make your entrepreneurial journey even more exciting. Introducing our podcast production services, your ticket to sharing your knowledge and stories without breaking a sweat. We know your time is gold. That's why our team of podcast pros will take the reins, handle all of the behind the scenes stuff. From brainstorming fun topics, introducing you to incredible guests, polishing up those episodes, repurposing your content so you can share among lots of platforms. We're here to turn your ideas into a podcast that's as easygoing as your favorite chat over coffee. Imagine establishing your expertise and your authority, making connections all across the globe, in just minutes a month. And the fun doesn't end there. Our data savvy approach gives you insights that will help you fine tune your content and connect with your audience even better than before. So join forces with a crew that's as enthusiastic about your podcast as you are about your business, the Smart Cookie Media crew. Let your voice resonate, your stories inspire, and your ideas spread like wildfire. Level up your personal brand through the magic of podcasting, whether you choose audio only or video too. Are you ready to dive into podcasting? Your journey to share your knowledge starts right here because it's your voice, your podcast with our expertise. Smart Cookie Media, turning your stories into conversations. Get you wrapped up with what is one of the key lessons you learned as an entrepreneur? I always tell myself two things. Do it now because procrastination will kill you. And the second thing I'll always say is I'm figuring this out. Because, you know, sometimes we always say to ourselves, I have to figure this out as of in this moment versus I'm figuring this out as a process. Oh, that's good. That's really oh. good. So you talked about five, 10 years on the road. How would you define your entrepreneurial success? You know what my entrepreneurial success, I believe, defines me is in that pause. The moment is all we have. And our life is just made up of all these moments. And so... My success really is understanding and living in the present. And when you come from that lens in business and sales, it's really hard to lose because it's from a place of gratitude, from a place of abundance, from a place of opportunity. Most of my success isn't from me. I didn't do any of this. I did it in co-creation with other people. And so I always feel like if I can present myself in that capacity, no matter what I'm selling or what I'm doing, and just being here to help whatever skill set I have, that's how you win. So motivational. Where do we get more of you? Where's the one place that people listening could connect with you and learn more about all that you do? Yeah, so creatorslearn.com is the best place. I call it Creators Learn because I believe entrepreneurs are creators. We can either be a victim of our circumstance or be creators of our future. So it's just a place for other entrepreneurs to learn about my particular business model and how they can implement it in their life. 
It's been an absolute blast. We could talk to you all day, but we'll let you get back to it. Thanks so much. Yes. Thanks, Jermaine. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Hey, it's Nicole, and that's the end of the interview. But stick around. This is the part where Matt and I break it all down and give you our favorite takeaways. Listen in. Okay, Matt, we just got done chatting with Jermaine, and let's do two funny takeaways and then like the big one, because I think the big one we clearly want to talk a lot about. Right. What do you got first? One that I have is, man, the love for Michael Jordan. It just goes far and wide, doesn't it? I mean, it just makes me happy as a 90s Chicagoland kid that other people love that guy as much as I do. Yes, definitely. I did find it a little interesting when we found out that you can't expect to just have the results of losing all that weight, working out one day a week for 12 weeks or six weeks here. Right. However short of a time period. I get what he's saying that, yeah, we all have to recognize there's a chance that we're jumping off that thing a little too early. Yep. A good reminder that we're problem solvers, but that doesn't mean we should solve all of the problems. Keep exactly. solving the one. Yeah. Or especially okay. if you've not given it a good, fair shot or shape at what you right. are trying to solve. That thing that's right. 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 Or that we should all maybe walk into the gym more than once. There was that. I felt like he was speaking yeah. to me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, let's get in the nitty gritty what we really want to talk okay. about. Right. So the big one for me, I think we both saw the takeaway right away and dove right in was about referral partners, finding those people that can be referral sources, really, not just, hey, can you refer me to somebody, but really to set us up in our business to have these humans, right? So he certainly was focused on the who that you could leverage. I would say other people might want to hear the word collaborate. Some may want to say you might borrow their audience, right? If we want to soften it down. But for those of us on this call, we all respond to the word leverage really well. And I think you and I had a couple of things to go on beyond, right? Like we let people borrow our audience and we borrow theirs when we're on podcasts or they're here. But I think we want to talk a little bit more about than just the who, like he talked about. Yeah, because I think he even acknowledges that it's also about the what. Like we talk about the who, the what, and the how. It has to be all three of them because, you know, when we talked about salons, for instance, he immediately said that's not for him. He can't grow it quick enough. It doesn't achieve his goals of five to 10 years. But yeah, we recognize that is a very lucrative business if done correctly, right? Paul Mitchell, Mario (laughs) Tricosi. And and like I said on the show, like it doesn't matter what it is you're doing. If you have passion behind it, finding what it is you can utilize that for and monetize it to achieve it is really what we're talking about. We say what? Guess what? One of those things you can utilize is people to get there with that. The what can be accurate. It's just maybe you had the wrong who, the wrong referral partners, the wrong clients. Yeah. Or- what you choose to do with it. So the what, not just the who, but what next, whether it's an educator like you brought up, whether it is a product line that you develop. And you may talk to one of your clients who happens to be a chemist, right? I think it's a myriad of all of those. He really focused on how he leverages people which makes a lot of sense because he doesn't have the product. You mentioned about, you know, there's not a pen for sale. So there's not the colorist or the actual color product line for sale or how one business owner runs her business as a salon owner versus how she can teach someone else or, you know, consult even. Like forget massive education across the country. If she were to consult just 10 business owners across the country, what that would do for her revenue would be pretty impressive. And so, yeah, we can leverage all of them, the who, the how, and the what. Yeah, exactly. Because that's frankly what you do a lot of too. Don't forget, you know, just to plug smart cookie, they know what they're doing over there when it comes to the how. That's something that I think we all recognize we struggle with because even in his own business model, if you're having to pick up the phone and take manual notes and having to manage all that data and manage all of that manually, yeah, you, you might eventually get to the right who, then how are you going to execute that relationship? How are you going to manage the data? How are you going to manage what goes on with that relationship? And so that's something to where I think you can't have one without the other. I think you have to look at all of those together, you know? Yeah, yeah. Man, rest in peace. I am reminded through this episode of my uncle who used to make 40 calls a day, 40 calls to grow his business every single day. And he was doing that right up until the week that we lost him suddenly. But I just want to give a shout out to anybody who knows what it's like to make calls, grow their business with that human touch. Even Alex Levin on episode, I believe it's going to be 83. We will link it. They were working with Angie's List for forever and how they made sure in their new software, Regal.io, that they were adding in the ability to have human touch, these things called phone calls. I'd be remiss if I didn't tip my hat to everybody who knows what it's like to grow a business by picking up the phone and building some relationships. Well, you know what we say, keep listening. Keep listening. You've been listening to The Serial Entrepreneur Show, produced by the team here at Smart Cookie Media. 